Good morning and welcome to Adult Sunday School at Grounded Church for October 25th, 2020. And this is going to be my last lesson before the presidential elections in 2020. So I feel like uh, we need to go through a lesson on God's view of the issues. Because these issues are not just issues for our presidential election. These are issues for our society and for our church and for ourselves. So if we love God and we've entered into a relationship with God, we should be learning about God and His ways. When Moses was on the mountaintop, he said this to God, and in Exodus 33, verse 13, we read these words of Moses. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Do you want to know God's ways? So many people really don't know God's ways because they have not studied or been taught from the Word of God what God's ways are. And God says in Isaiah 55, 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are, my, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Do you want to know God's ways? Now this is an extremely important question because, for every Christian, because we might be in error and don't even know it. Now you may say, well I've studied the Bible and, and quite well and I think I know God's ways, and you may be correct. Uh, but if you were presented with scriptures and, that shows you that you've been in error or wrong about something all your Christian life, and now that you see the scriptures as revealing something new to you, could you change? This is an extremely important question that I want us all to be absolutely honest and transparent with ourselves. On the surface, we'd say, yeah, well, we would, but would we? Let me give you a couple of examples. The Pharisees and the Apostle Peter. You see, the Pharisees, they get a, a bad rap, and yeah, they, they did a lot of bad things, but they devoted their lives to knowing the Scriptures. And there were occasions when Jesus actually commended them for having their theology correct. For example, the Pharisees did believe in the resurrection from the dead as opposed to the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. But we all know that the Pharisees missed it big time when they failed to recognize Jesus as the Messiah even though they were acquainted with scriptures quite well and knew all of what the prophets said about the coming Messiah, they missed it big time. Jesus also had to call out the Pharisees for their wrong theology, uh, for following traditions rather than uh, what God had said. And there were many times the traditions did not uh, coincide with what God had instituted. It was just something made up of men. Jesus tried to reason with them, but their minds were closed to change because they thought they were right, and they were the experts. So here's the lesson that I want us to think about very clearly. We can cling to uh, our current beliefs and believe to be correct so hard that when God wants to give you a, a seismic, life-altering revelation, we could fall into the trap of telling ourselves that no, we're, what we believe is right and proceed to defend our belief on the issue without really listening and considering this new information. Now, I'm not saying that you just believe every new thing that comes down the pike. Uh, obviously, the scripture is quite clear about warning us to examine things. In, John, in 1 John 4, verse 1, we read these words, and you're familiar with them. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. 
And also uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, Test all things and hold fast to what is good. Even for this lesson, uh, check out the references that I give you. Uh, any good teacher or preacher would welcome uh, scrutiny and dialogue about what they teach or preach. The Bible commends those who search the scripture to verify a new teaching or revelations. For example, in Acts 17.11, we read these words. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than, the, than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message from Paul with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So the Pharisees was an example of those who refused uh, to change when they were confronted with the truth. But now let's look at the Apostle Peter, who is an example of someone, a believer, who did change when presented with a new revelation from God. Peter was a Christian, and he had been brought up in the Jewish tradition and was told that Gentiles, the non-Jewish people of the world, uh, were to be avoided. They were unclean. They were defiled and had nothing to do with them. So uh, they were shunned by the Jewish people. But in Acts uh, chapter 10, we read the story of, of uh, Peter and Cornelius. And uh, Cornelius had sent for Peter to uh, come and explain the way of the Lord more clearly. And uh, in Acts chapter 10, verse 9, we read this uh, account about noon the following day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. And to make a long story short, he had a vision from God, which basically was telling Peter that uh, whatever God calls clean, man is not to call unclean. This, and in particular, uh, God was saying that if he uh, shed his blood and purified and sanctified the Gentiles that were coming to Christ, Peter had to accept them, even though they were Gentiles previously. So, uh, God was instituting the new covenant, and this was even though it was something new, it had been told about in the scriptures and the prophets. So uh, we read that Peter did change and went with God's uh, new revealed uh, covenant and ways. And Peter said in Acts 10, 28, here's what he was saying to the, the people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. We live in a fallen world. Every human being that is born into this world, including us Christians, have a sin nature. We are born selfish. Our minds do not always think clearly and biblically because we tend to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to, and that's just part of the sin nature, the fallenness of this world. I like to quote Jeremiah 17, 9 very frequently, and you should memorize it and apply it to your life as well. And here's what it says. The heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Even for Christians, we need to always keep in mind that we can easily be deceived by this world system and by our own personal desires. All of us have to go to the Word constantly and get a biblical reality check because our hearts will tend to deceive us over time. And that's no defect other than the fact that we live in a fallen world and we have to always go back to the objective truth of God's Word. We must always go with the truth that God re reveals in the Bible, no matter what anybody says. We have been influenced by our mother, our grandmothers, or the people we love dearly, and we just want to cling to what they believed because they were so godly and we loved them so much. But even our, our 
dearest friends and parents and significant influencers can on occasion be wrong. So we have to understand that God's word is the standard and not what anybody says or thinks. So why am I pushing this point? Well, I've seen and heard of Christians leaning towards thinking that some sins are not sins. And I've seen and heard Christians leaning towards thinking that some sins are not so bad and we shouldn't be making such a big fuss about them. Trivializing any sin is wrong because all it takes is one sin to keep a person out of heaven. When a Christian trivializes or minimizes the consequences of a sin, we are in effect saying that the behavior is not so bad and in effect others may be prone to commit that sin. So we could be causing the fall or the stumbling of other people, including our brothers and sisters in Christ. God holds us, his ambassadors, responsible if we are silent for peop, uh, for silent when people say, oh, it's okay to be gay, or abortion is a woman's choice. God holds us responsible when we say things like, well, I don't agree with what you're doing. I think it's wrong, but I'll defend your right to do it. No, that is the wrong attitude and perspective uh, for a Christian. We need to be the watchman for our families and for our society. Listen to what God says in Ezekiel chapter 3 beginning in verse 17. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel, for his countrymen. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not warn them or speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life, and I might add their eternal soul, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person and they do not turn from their wickedness or their evil ways, they will die for their sin, but you will have saved yourself because we fulfilled the duty to warn them. And that's what's so important. We have a duty to warn society as watchmen and ambassadors for Christ. Wow, the church has been far too long silent and has not spoken up against the evils that have been slipped into acceptance in our society. We're not being judgmental when we tell people that homosexuality, abortion, and sexual immorality are sins that separate a person from God. The most loving thing we can do is to warn them in an effort to save their souls from eternal judgment. Furthermore, just as we read, God holds us responsible if we don't warn society that they are opposing God. So today we're going to look at these three sins of homosexuality, sexual immorality, and abortion. Uh, there are obviously other sins, but these uh, sins don't seem to get as much attention from pulpits today. They are hot button issues for sure, but we cannot avoid them because uh, these are evils that separate people from God, and God is not pleased with these sins in our society. Homosexuality is a sin that our country condones and sees nothing wrong with. It has become ingrained in our culture as acceptable behavior because the church as a collective whole in this country has not stood up in a unified way and called this sin a sin and explained why. With time, many churches have just given up the fighting of the culture. They have lost their saltiness. They don't want to deal with the consequences, the pushback, the backlash from the sinners uh, who uh, sinners who now control the media, the government, and uh, the educational systems 
our schools. As a matter of fact, some churches now accept the sin of homosexuality as not being sinful anymore. They even have homosexual pastors and leaders. They have and celebrate homosexual weddings as something good. And I think the Catholic Church needs to deal with their heretical pope who now puts his uh, seal of approval on this sin. You know, Jesus' anger burned against church leaders who ought to know better. But many people inside of churches don't see anything wrong with homosexual because they have not been taught what's wrong with homosexuality. For me or for any teacher, just to stand up and say that it's wrong is not enough. We have to explain why it is wrong. Because simply declaring a sin to be wrong without explaining why is not enough anymore in this society. Declaration without explanation is the very reason that we as Christians are accused of being judgmental. It is the duty of the church to show why these hot button issues are sins through teaching from the Bible. This is why I say it's not what you or I or anybody else says is wrong, right or wrong, but it's rather what God says, the Creator says, is right or wrong. Truth is not up for a vote or popular opinion. God is the Creator of human sexuality. He created it with a purpose. Sex is only for this physical lifetime here on earth. It's only temporary. Jesus said there was no marriage between humans in heaven. Sex in this life was designed by God to foreshadow the intimate personal relationship believers are to have with Christ. God created one gender to physically receive into their person the other gender, and we as humans are created to receive the Lord into our being so that there can be a holy spiritual oneness with God. If there is no knowledge of God in a person, then they are left to seek pleasure and avoid pain in whatever they want. They, and without knowledge of God, we see uh, time and time again throughout history of nations falling because of moral corruption, with homosexuality being in the final stages of their fall. And I submit to you that the civilizations of Rome and Greece as prime examples of that. In Leviticus chapter 18, this is a very revealing chapter where God gives his views directly from his mouth on the nations who pursue sexual pleasures in ways that are contrary to God's design. You should read and study this chapter, Leviticus 18, in detail. The first part of the chapter, uh, God reveals and lists specific sexual sins in detail what they are and homosexuality is one of them in that list but then he says uh, some things that we sh should all pay attention to remember as we read these verses that they are quotes from the mouth of God so we're going to begin in Leviticus 18 uh, verse 24 after God has uh, explained all of the sexual sins, what they are. In verse 24, God says, Do not defile yourself in any of these ways, because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sins, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you must... Keep my decrees and my laws. The native poor and the foreigners residing among you must not do any of these detestable things. God is saying that even if you and others believe, uh, and other believers don't engage in these uh, sins, if you allow these sins to occur in your country, then you are defiling your country. You are defiling the land. Uh, and before God by doing that and you open the door for God's judgment if you allow these sins to continue unopposed. So when we vote for people 
And people in, poli in political parties that condone these sexual sins, you are voting against God and his stated policy for societies. That's strong, but that is the truth as we have just read. Verse 27. For all of these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, if you defile your country, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. Everyone who does any of these detestable things, such persons must be cut off from their people. Keep my requirements and do not follow any of the detestable customs that were practiced before you came and do not defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord. So these sexual sins, sexual immorality, abortion, homosexuality, these are all sins that defile a person and separate them from God. Now remember, sin is deceitful. It will try to trick people like Eve. And here are some of the lies that we hear. Oh, there's no consequences to that behavior. God is a God of love and accepts everybody as they are. They were born that way. These are all lies, uh, slick lies from the enemy to try and justify these sexual sins. So when extreme... Immorality and perversion is condoned and allowed by a society that more and more people will become involved because these sins stimulate the pleasure centers of our brains. And then these people accept these practices without shame or guilt regardless of whether or not they do these things themselves. And that's what's happening in America uh, just like it's been happening in Europe. People throw off restraint they indulge in these sexual uh, pleasures and perversions and it makes the young people feel obligated because that's the normal behavior that they're seeing all around them. So young people who grow up in the church, when they finally get on their own, they see the immorality, they're drawn to it because of the, their hormones, and they jettison their faith so that their consciences won't bother them as they pursue worldly pleasures. And this is one of the major reasons why young people leave the faith. But there are other consequences as well. And we're going to go to Romans chapter 1 and begin in verse 24, describing the consequences of people who accept and embrace these sexual sins and don't think there's anything wrong with them. It says, therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. Three times in those verses we just read, uh, we read the words, God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over. In effect, God is saying, you want it, you can have it. But the following verses explains what happens to these people who are unrestrained and embrace sins. There's a consequence when you, when you go down that slippery so slope. In verse 29, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters. Listen to that. God-haters. And we see that manifesting everywhere homosexuality is approved of. 
This is a mindset that is in reckless pursuit of pleasure at any cost, even if you have to pervert God's word just to justify what you want to do. And we see that all the time in our society. So they are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also uh, approve of those who do that. We see this very thing in our society today. People who embrace their sins are quite open about it, even deeper into depravity. And they also want others to approve and celebrate their sins. Furthermore, they become quite hostile to anyone who even expresses a different opinion. When we as Christians point out these behaviors as sins, we do so out of love for our fellow citizens because just as we have read, God's wrath comes upon countries who allow these sins. It doesn't matter how they slickly or, or intelligently uh, justify their sins, God has spoken. And we as ambassadors have a duty to warn no matter how negative the reaction will be because of, as we have read in Ezekiel, God will hold us responsible for not speaking up and warning people about the truth. So now I hope that you can see why the behavior of homosexuality is a sin that we must speak out against. So now we're going to move on for the, to the next issue of sexual immorality, which we have already kind of touched on. Uh, sexual immorality is just sex outside of biblical marriage, and it is an issue that the church has surrendered on. Because of our silence in the past, sex outside of biblical marriage has become rampant. Men and women having consensual sex outside of biblical marriage isn't even recognized in America as the tremendous sin that it still is. The pulpits have been silent at calling this sin out, so people both in and out of churches don't even know that it's a sin. And many pastors are afraid to preach or teach that sex before marriage is a sin because they have many of their members who are attending church who are just living together and they don't want to offend them. So the silence from the pulpits <laughs> has been and is so deafening that if a Christian pastor or leader today speaks up on this sin and calls it out for the sin it really is, they will be shouted down, laughed at, judged as being judgmental, marginalized, ignored, or even called an evil person. So because we, collectively, as the church in America, have failed to be the watchman for our church and our country, we now see the natural consequences of rampant sexual immorality, which is abortion. And abortion also has been accepted and is running rampant in our country. I will say that the spilling of the blood of innocent babies by abortion has moved many Christians and many churches to finally speak up and act against abortion. And that's great. That's wonderful. But do we realize that there are many people in the church, especially the younger generations, that do not see the big deal about abortion? We have failed to speak with clarity what God has said about uh, his position is on the issues of abortion, homosexuality, and sexual immorality. We are supposed to be God's ambassador, ambassadors for Christ and His holiness. It's not always a pleasant thing. It's not always about just God's love. Sometimes we have to, with clarity, speak and teach about sin. So let's tackle these issues a little bit deeper. Let's go to the scripture and find out what God says and not what public opinion says. Let's find the truth and not what we think is truth. Let's not distort God's love with God's demand for righteousness and holiness. We are not the first people 
to go astray from God's ways and God's truth. The good news is that there is hope for any nation, and our nation as well. But the leaders of the American churches must be unified in speaking the truth in love and calling out sins that we have accepted in our uh, country, in our culture. The world says, and many churches now also think, that men and women have been having sex outside of biblical marriage for so long since the beginning of, of human, uh, the human race. They think it's just natural and normal to fill an ap fulfill an appetite that we natu naturally have. Sex just being one of those appetites. And the Apostle Paul addressed this very thing even back in uh, biblical days. And we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 beginning in verse 13. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food and God will destroy both of them. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a, person's, a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. A Christian must believe that God is the creator of men and women and human sexuality. He created sex with a design and a purpose that transcends the fulfilling of an appetite or the seeking of a pleasure. We are not animals controlled by our instincts as the, sex, as the secular scientists want to declare. We are above the animals because humans were made in the image and the likeness of God himself. We can choose to override desires when we recognize them as being harmful and sinful. In Genesis, Chapter 1, we read in verse 27, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. But then in the very next verse, we read that mankind was given rulership over this earth. God blessed them and, and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. We are on God's level because we were made to have an intimate, personal relationship with God. We are on the earth in mortal bodies to learn how to control our desires and impulses so that we can receive immortal bodies and not fall again like Adam and Eve. So human life is very special to God. And we read in Genesis 9, verses 5 and 6, these words. And for your life, blood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal. And from each human being, too, I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed, for in the image of God, because in the image of God has God made mankind. That is why abortion is wrong. It is the taking of a human life made in the image of God before it leaves the woman's body. And life begins at conception. And we this is confirmed in the Bible in the story of Samson's birth in the book of Judges. And we read... In Judges chapter 13, beginning at verse 2, 
A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was sterile and remained childless. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are sterile and childless, but you are going to conceive and have a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, and that you do not eat anything unclean, because you will conceive and give birth to a son. No razor may be used on his head, because the boy is to be a Nazarite, set apart to God from birth, and he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Now many scholars believe that the angel of the Lord was not just any angel, but it was Jesus Christ uh, before he was born in Bethlehem. In any case, the angel announced that the boy would be set apart by God to begin the deliverance of the nation of Israel from the hand of the Philistines. And this angel specifically states that the boy is to be a Nazarite. Now Nazarites were Jews who voluntarily made an oath to separate themselves to God's service. And part of that oath of separation was for the Nazarite to voluntarily abstain from eating anything made from grapes such as wine or, or just grape juice or even the skin or, or any part of the grape or the juice of the grape. But in Samson's case, the angel announced that uh, Samson would be a Nazarite from birth. As a matter of fact, the angel told Samson's mother before she conceived to begin abstaining from grapes and grape-related foods and drinks so that the baby in her womb would never have the grape products introduced from the mother's bloodstream. God ordained before conception that this special life will be specially anointed to do a specific work. Always remember the words of the angel and how the mother was to start abstaining before conception. And it is because of these words we can see that God considers life to begin at conception. And to further solidify this, we'll go to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So a human life actually begins in the mind of God before conception. But that life is not detectable in the physical world until there is a conception. Since God is omniscient, he knows every life that is conceived. If God allows a conception, there is a life. Now listen to how God commanded, uh, how God's commands show how he values and gives protection to babies in the womb. Please look up the following verses for yourselves in your own Bible and see that I'm not making these things up or taking things out of context. In Exodus, chapter 21 beginning in verse 22 listen to these commands if people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely but there is no serious injury the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows but if there is serious injury you are to take life for life eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. So what about doctors and healthcare workers who perform abortion and dismembers babies in the womb? Saline abortion poisons and burns the baby while in the womb. I might add that no anesthesia is given to the baby while its brain and spinal fluids are being suctioned out as their head is still in the, in the womb and their body is hanging out. No anesthesia is given in late term partial birth abortions while the doctor goes in there and dismembers the baby still in the womb. So let's reread 
what God's words are as quoted by Moses in the book of Exodus. Again, I, I need to read that again. Exodus 21, verse, beginning at verse 22. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise, end of quote. Now I know that there's going to be some people who will want to protest my use of Old Testament laws to prove my point. Those commands and laws were given to the Israelites under the theocracy of God in the wilderness where God exercised complete rule over his people. And it is true we do not live in a theocracy here in the United States. However, those who want to go to heaven should understand that they will be living under God's theocracy in heaven. And furthermore, listen to these words of God as quoted by the prophet Malachi. In Malachi 3.6, these are direct quotes from the mouth of God. I, the Lord, do not change. What was sin in the Old Testament is still sin today. And Jesus affirms this in Matthew 5.17 when Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not, not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. On the basis of the logical argument that I have presented with scriptures in their proper context as my backing, it would seem very logical to conclude that God is against abortion, which is just a modern day form of child sacrifice on the altar of convenience. Now I know there have been women that are listening to this and, and the guilt of, of that people who have committed sexual immorality, all of these sins that we have listed, many have uh, those sins in their past, but the, the good news of the gospel is you can be forgiven of all of your past sins, even these sins, if you will come to Christ and accept His truth and His ways and receive Him as Lord in your life. And uh, again, God is against the uh, sin of sexual immorality that leads to abortion. So if we rightly deal with rampant sexual immorality and adultery, then we will elim all but eliminate the need for abortions. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 2, we read these words. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of of the Lord Jesus. It is the Lord's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this manner no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. This, is, I believe, has been an extremely important lesson and it needs to be heard by every believer. We must become serious watchmen and ambassadors for Christ. It's not an easy thing to do, I, I, I know that, because we have to teach the truth about how bad sin is, as well as uh, how loving and forgiving God is uh, to those who accept His truth and turn to Him. Again, 
If you've committed one of those sins, there is forgiveness, there is grace, there is acceptance. But we cannot, as children and believers of God, continue to be silent as these sins run rampant in our society. I encourage you, I implore you, I exhort you to learn these things. Prepare yourself to be able to speak about these sins when you're in uh, private and public com uh, conversation. We have to be the watchman and ambassador for Christ. And again, it is not always an easy thing, so we must be studied and prayed up so that we can speak the truth of love. Thank you very much. And again, be sure if you haven't already, please go and vote for candidates and political parties that are most closely aligned with biblical values. There, there is no perfect candidate. Everyone is a sinner. But their uh, policies and their ways, we need to be voting for people that most closely align with biblical values. Thank you very much for your time.